Okay, looks like it's eight o'clock, uh, so we'll get started. Hello, guys. Um, thank you for coming on a Friday night and joining us with a live session. But we have a very exciting call. This is uh, Dr. F uh, Fatima Galani. Um, I'm going to introduce. Uh, so here's how things are going to go today. I'm going to introduce her, and then I have a couple announcements, and then we'll get started with the call. So Dr. Galani, a little bit about herself. She's a uh, double board certified ophthalmologist um, from US and Canada. She's a cataract and refractive surgeon um, and a medical retina specialist. Uh, an important announcement. So this is our last call for this year, um, but that doesn't mean this is the last call of the program. Uh, we'll have um, more, more calls coming up in the next year. Uh, with that being said, also regarding the summaries, for those who have been uh, following along with all of our previous calls and have been watching, um, we have said that you can hold on until the end, but now we're saying that all summaries are gonna be due December 15th. So make sure to um, get those sent out. Uh, this includes uh, summaries from call through fall and zooming through summer. And if you need more information about what goes in a summary and where to go to, please check us out um, in the link in our Instagram bio. Um, and we explain everything about that. Um, also, another thing about, um, we also have a volunteering um, part of our uh, part. Um, so, and volu volunteering opportunities will uh, continue through December and into 2021. So if you wanna learn more about it, um, go on to officialclubmed.volunteering uh, about additional information about all the programs that we offer and see how you can get involved. Okay, and now it's time to hear from Dr. Galani. Um, I'll let Dr. Donna Galani introduce herself. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Hi there. So my name is Fatima Gilani um, and I'm an ophthalmologist. Thank you so much for spending your Friday evening with us today. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, so this is gonna be the basic format of what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about my journey, how it is I got here, um, what the process is to become an ophthalmologist. And then I'm gonna go through a few common cases. So I'm a retina specialist, and so we have to cover a little macular degeneration. Um, I'll also cover a little bit of common retina pathology. Um, and then we'll do a little front of the eye stuff. So that's the cataract and refractive stuff. And that we'll do, uh, we'll go over some cataract information, some LASIK information. And then at the end, I'll provide some resources for you. I have some videos that we can watch, but I don't know how much time we'll have. So depending on how much time we have, maybe we'll get through them and maybe we'll have to have you watch those on your own. And then I think, I hope that will take about 45 minutes or 50 minutes, and then we can spend 10 minutes at answering some questions at the end. So That'll kind of be the format we're going to go through. So where am I from? Um, I've had a really unique journey. Um, I actually grew up in Kenya. So it's in Africa. It's in East Africa. I grew up in a really small city called Kisumu. So it's right here on the shores of Lake Victoria. Um, my family has been there for four generations. My parents actually still live there. Um, a little bit of a history lesson for you. So my great grandparents used to live in India. Um, and India and Kenya are both British colonies. So the British went to India, they built the railway, and then they came to Kenya or East Africa and wanted to build a railway in East Africa. And so they brought the Indian engineers down to East Africa. And with that came a big migration of people. And so my um, great grandparents actually moved to Uganda, which is the country right here. Um, and the leader of the country, Idi Amin, kicked out all of the people that were not African from the country. And so my, my great grandparents ended up moving to Kenya. My grandfather then moved to the town we live in, Kisumu, and he opened a bread factory. And so we still run the red, my parents still live in Kisumu today and still run the red factory. Um, but that's to say that my parents are also not doctors. So for anyone who would like to become a doctor and is worried because they don't have a parent that's a doctor, that's not a problem. Um, this is a picture of Kisumu, the sunset in Kisumu, which we're famous for. And on cold winter days like today, I definitely really miss home. So I think the really important piece of all of this um, is to figure out your why. Um, the really nice thing about being in the position a lot of you're in right now is you're still very early in your career. Um, when you talk to people, they typically know what they do. They typically know how they do it. But very few people actually know why they're doing what they're doing. 
Um, and I think it's a really important thing to sit down and try to figure out for yourself because that is what's going to end up being your compass. Um, if you do want to go into medicine and actually, regardless of what you want to go into, it's hard work. There's going to be days where you're going to be tired. You're going to be sick of studying. Um, and you're going to wonder what you're doing this all for. And I think that if you have your why that becomes your compass and that becomes something you fall back on all the time, uh, when you're having those really hard days. So I think it's really important at this point to sit and really think about why it is, um, you want to do what you, you what you, why it is you're doing what you're doing. Um, and I think that COVID has led to a time where people are really spending a lot of um, time at home and thinking about their careers. Um, and if you listen to what people are forecasting about the future, one of the things that I keep hearing over and over again is about finding meaningful work. And I think if you figure out your why early and then build your career around that, you will find meaningful work and you will find purpose in your work. And um, I think that'll become a really important compass for you. So I went to boarding school in Kenya when I was young. And then once I was done with boarding school in Kenya, I ended up moving to Canada, which is where I went to high school. Um, so I did my grade 9, 10, 11, 12 in Canada. Um, every time I moved systems, they somehow, my birthday's in September, and they somehow ended up moving me ahead a year. So by the time I was done with high school, I was really young. I was 16 years old. Um, and I decided I didn't want to go to university quite yet. Um, so I negotiated with my parents, and we decided that I could take a gap year. So I took a gap year, and I deferred my entrance to university by a year. Um, during high school, I actually did the IB program. Um, I don't know if that's available to any of you, but I did the IB program while I was in high school. Um, and that actually was really nice as far as a foundation goes for a university. I mean, it even helped me in medical school. So while I was on my gap year, I had already decided that I wanted to go to medical school. Um, sorry, I know I told you guys to figure out your why. What was my why for going to medical school? So. When I was um, a teenager, I decided I thought I wanted to become a doctor. So I went and I spent some time in hospitals in Kenya. Um, and I thought I wanted to be a pediatrician. So I spent some time in pediatric wards in Kenya. And um, there was kids that came in with malnutrition. Um, I remember one child, uh, her mom brought her in. She was very malnourished. She was about 12 years old. Um, and she was so malnourished, her skin had actually started to break down. And we went to visit her um, and she had been getting worse and her mom was there with another baby and um, her mom was crying. And basically what she had done is she had decided to take the food that was being fed to this daughter that was malnourished and was giving it to her little baby because she decided that she only had enough resources for one child and so was going to put the resources into the baby instead of into this 12 year old that was already malnourished and already dying um and so that was she basically had to pick and she had to pick where she was going to allocate her resources as a parent um and i looked at that and i looked at all of the children that were actually dying in hospitals um, and I thought that there was a real problem with the system. I thought that there was a problem with, yeah, there was a real problem with the system, that it wasn't okay that people were dying and I wanted to be part of the solution. And so that's basically why I went to medical school is because I felt like there's a lot of inequity, there was a lot of problems in the world and I wanted to be part of fixing the problems. So I knew early that I wanted to go to medical school. Um, the British system is a little different than the, than the North American system. And since I grew up in Kenya, um, I grew up sort of in the British system, which, which is where you essentially enter your vocation early. So if you want to go to law school, you go to law school out of high school. If you want to go to medical school, you go to medical school out of high school. And so while I was on my gap year, um, I applied to some universities in the UK. And my dream was to go to Cambridge University. And I got an interview. And I didn't get it. <laughs> and I thought my life was over. I thought I was never going to be able to become a doctor. Um, the interview was really hard. I have gone to medical school and residency and fellowship, and I've been practicing, and I still probably couldn't answer those questions that they asked me during my interview. So yeah, I mean, you will hit road bumps along the way. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about is some of the road bumps you're going to hit. And it's OK. It's all going to work out. So I then applied, I mean, so then I went to university in Canada, which was Queen's University. 
Um, and while I was there, I started researching medical school. So at the time, the average age of students going to medical school was 26 years old. Most students getting in um, had one undergraduate degree. Most had either two undergraduate degrees or a master's degree. Um, and so I kind of looked at it and thought, well, if I'm going to have to get two degrees before I can go to medical school, and I know I want to go to medical school now, I may as well pursue other options available. I had a friend who had, she was a friend of a friend of a friend, and she had done the first degree, didn't get into medical school, so was part was going through her second degree and decided to apply to this university in Ireland. Um, and went and got into this university in Ireland, was telling me about it, said it was a great university, really great opportunities to come back to North America. And so I essentially uh, finished my first year at, at, of life sciences and then applied to uh, medical school in Ireland. So I went to the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Um, they have a six-year program, a five-year program, and a four-year program. So if you would like to go straight out of high school, um, yeah, there's one destination, many different ways to get there. And I think that that's important for you to keep in mind right now um, is that there's many different options available and you don't just have to follow one path. So the Royal College of Surgeons is a university in Ireland. Um, there is a six-year program and the six-year program, like I said, you can go straight out of high school. Um, the American requirement, since I know a lot of you are in the US, um, is, you need to have a minimum overall GPA of 3.5 in grade 12. Um, they do have on their website what courses you need to take. Um, I know you have to take biology, chemistry, and um, math. And then for the five-year program, I think they want you to also have taken organic chemistry. So I hadn't taken organic chemistry, and that's why I had to do the six-year program. So they have lots of information on their website about how, um, what the entrance requirements are like and um, what the program's like. So the first three years of medical school, the first year is a foundation year. It's essentially where you do all of your pre-med courses. Um, and then within, after your second and third year, you start to do clinical rotations as well. So how is it that you decide on a specialty? Um, in your third, in your fourth and fifth year, you do seven week rotations. Um, the seven week rotations are classically in the classic subspecialty, in the classic specialties, so medicine, surgery, general practice, psychiatry. Um, ophthalmology is a very specialized field. Uh, most people that go into ophthalmology either knew an ophthalmologist, have a family member that's an ophthalmologist, um, or there's some reason that they become ophthalmologists because you typically get one week of ophthalmology training during your medical school uh, rotations. And by that time, it's kind of too late for you to decide you wanna go into ophthalmology. So how did I end up in ophthalmology? Well, one of the other things you should make sure you pay attention to is sometimes it takes being at the right place at the right time and meeting the right people. So for me, I actually was sitting on a plane and the person sitting next to me happened to be an ophthalmologist. And he asked me what I was doing. I was in my third year of medical school. He said, well, when you have the opportunity, you should really consider doing an ophthalmology elective. So when you're at medical school, you have the chance to pick um, certain, there's certain blocks they give you that's flexible time. And the flexible time you get to pick what specialty you do. And so he said to me, um, ophthalmology is a really great field. Uh, it's a great balance of medicine and surgery. Uh, he absolutely loved his career. He was uh, several years into it and said that he, he, he really had a great work-life balance as well. Um, and he said, yeah, when you get the opportunity, see if you can do an ophthalmology elective. So I went back to medical school and the following year I had the opportunity to do a ophthalmology elective and fell in love with the field. So maybe for someone on this call, this is going to be what it is for you. But yeah, I highly recommend it as well. I think that um, one of the other things I did while I was at medical school is when I would be on a rotation, I would talk to the person, the, the doctors I was working with, and I would say, if you had to go back, would you do this specialty? Would you go back? Would you go to medical school? Would you, if you had to live your life again, would you go back and do this? Um, and I can say from an ophthalmology standpoint, I think absolutely. It's a really great field. Um, I think it's a really great field. Why did I pick it? I think it's a really great balance of medicine and surgery. Um, one of the really nice things is you're tangibly improving the quality of life of your patients. 
So I feel, I felt like in a lot of medicine, patients come in and you take care of them. You make, you, you try to maintain where they're at today. So you try to maintain the quality of life that they have today, but with ophthalmology, you're actually improving their quality of life. So if they have cataracts, you remove the cataracts and they actually are seeing way better than when they came in to see you. Um, and you're alleviating a lot of burden of disease. I think even from a retina standpoint, when it comes to macular degeneration, uh, a lot of those patients would actually go blind and now they're able to see better. Um, we see those patients, some we're seeing them once a month forever. And so you actually get to develop really great relationships with your patients, um, which I think is also a really nice thing to have because in a lot of surgical specialties, you don't get that. You basically see your patient, you take care of the surgical problem, and then you never see them again. Um, the nice thing about ophthalmology is you have a balance of that. So there's definitely some patients you see, you take care of their problem, you don't see them again. Um, and then there's some patients you get the opportunity to build long relationships with, which becomes a really nice part of practice. So how does it all work? Um, one of the nice things, again, about the medical school in Ireland is because there's people from uh, 60 different nationalities, they do a really good job of helping you go back to wherever you want to go. So um, the general thing, the general scheme of things is a lot of people are going to the US. Um, if you do want to, so with ophthalmology specifically, um, I made the decision to come to go to the US and do all of my training. Um, one of the really important steps with residency and getting into residency is your USMLEs. So the USMLE is a medical licensing exam. Um, I don't know about this anymore, but when I took the exam over 10 years ago now, um, it basically is like a gatekeeper. So you have to meet certain requirements to be able to apply to certain specialties. They don't force this on you, but there's certain specialties where you're required to have higher scores. Um, ophthalmology is one of them. So ophthalmology is a very competitive field. Um, so the, so there's certain, so there's certain fields, which they call the road to happiness, radiology, ophthalmology, anesthesia, dermatology. Those are considered the lifestyle specialties. And so they become very competitive because everyone wants to go into them. The reason I'm even talking about the USMLEs is because that's where I had my first road bump. So as I mentioned, your USMLEs are very important. Um, I studied for them. I spent three months studying for my USMLEs. I lost 15 pounds. I went home and lived with my parents and that's all I did, studied for the exam. Um, I took the exam in Kenya in an unair conditioned room with no running water in the bathrooms. It was a disaster of a place and they've upgraded it since then. Um, but the exam is eight hours and the last hour, and sorry, the exam's eight hours. And in my last hour, I hear this big crash outside and the lights go out and the machine turns off. And so the moderator walks in and says, step away from your computer. So I step away from my computer. Um, there had been a car accident outside and the car accident had knocked over this power pole and they'd lost power to the testing center. So I'm freaking out because this is my licensing exam that I've now lost part of. Um, we wait, we wait. So they said, okay, maybe the power will come back. We wait a few hours, power doesn't come back. So they said, okay, we'll have to call you. So they call me back a few days later and they say, well, we have to have an investigation. So they have an investigation. They end up scoring my exam. So essentially they scored my exam and the way that they did it is that I essentially got zero. So it's like I got all the questions wrong in that last block. So I passed the exam, um, but the score that they got, that they gave me was not a very good score because I basically was missing one entire block. So they gave me two options. They said, you can either take the score or you can take the exam again without a penalty. Um, so I obviously said, okay, well, I'll take the exam again without a penalty. Um, and I couldn't take it again for six months. So at that point, I thought this was the worst thing ever. Um, but it actually ended up being kind of a blessing in disguise because I already had this foundation of information. And then I spent the next mo six months sort of studying for the exam. And so by the time I took the exam for the second time, I ended up getting a great score that allowed me to have the confidence to even apply to ophthalmology. 
Um, so I think that's the first road bump that I'm going to talk about. And just keep in mind, sometimes things happen in your life that you think are the end of the world and the worst thing ever, and they end up being a blessing. Um, the other thing I think is important is don't listen to people when they say you can't do something. So again, ophthalmology is very competitive. I was a foreign medical graduate. Um, I didn't have a lot of research. I didn't really know anyone in the field. Um, and you're applying to something that's really competitive. So everyone told me not to bother. They said, you're never going to get in. You're wasting your time. You're going to spend all this time and energy applying to a field that you're never going to get into. Um, and so I, I didn't even know any ophthalmologists. So I called my cousin who was, uh, also a medical student. I said, do you know any ophthalmologists? He said, well, actually, yeah, a friend of mine's dad is an ophthalmologist. Uh, his name is Dr. Raymond Stein. Um, and I said, do you think he'd be willing to talk to me? And he said, sure. So I went, I met up with him. Um, he reviewed my application with me and he basically said, listen, you might as well go for it. He said, you have very little to lose. And you have a lot to gain because it's a really awesome field. If you don't get in, cross that bridge when you get there, but you may as well try. Um, and so he was one of two people that supported me in it. Uh, and full circle, that's actually why I live in Toronto now, is I ended up working for him 10 years later. So yeah, definitely don't listen to people when they say you can't do something because yeah, sometimes, and sometimes it does just take having one person supporting you for you to go for something. That was my little inspirational quote for you. So you must not let anyone define your limits because of where you came from. Your only limit is your soul. Okay, so residency. Um, residency in ophthalmology is slightly different. So you do a preliminary year and the preliminary year is either in medicine or in surgery and you apply to that separately. So you apply for preliminary year and you apply to ophthalmology residency. Um, the ophthalmology residency program is three years and then you can do a fellowship. So I didn't know any of this, even while I was at medical school, I remember doing electives. And when I was doing my electives is when I was the first time that I even knew that this is the structure. I thought you finished medical school and then you magically were a doctor. I, yeah, I didn't know that you had to go through all these extra steps and you often see the end products. You'll say, oh, let me go shadow a doctor. You see the end product, like a family medicine doctor, you see the end product and you don't know how many steps it takes to get there, but it's actually a few steps. Um, and so then you can also do a fellowship. So what are fellowships? So you can further specialize. So just so we're on the, on the same um, playing field, essentially I did a medical retina fellowship. So what is that? So this is a picture of the eye. Um, you can kind of think of the eye like a camera. So the front part of the eye here is the cornea. This blue part is your iris, so the colored part of your eye. There's a lens back here. And then the eye is lined um, with the retina, which is kind of like the camera film of the eye. Um, and that's kind of how you can think about it. So I decided to specialize in medical retina, which is specializing in this camera film layer of the eye. Um, there's actually seven subspecialties in ophthalmology, which I know sounds crazy since it's already so small. But yeah, you can become an oculoplastic surgeon, which they basically do plastic surgery of the eye. So the eyelids, any trauma, um, they'll also do Botox, they'll do uh, fillers, they'll do, so there's some of it that's cosmetic, but some of it that's also trauma or, um, or yeah, needing to do eyelid lifts when you have drooping eyelids. Um, then there's pediatrics, so you can become a pediatric ophthalmologist. Um, you can become a cornea specialist, so you can become a front of the eye specialist here. Uh, you can become a glaucoma specialist, which um, has to do with increased eye pressure affecting the optic nerve here. You can become a neuro-ophthalmologist, which, which specializes in the optic nerve. Um, and you can become a pathologist. So you actually can develop cancer in the eye. Um, and so one of the things that they do many things, but one of the things they'll do in the eye or around the eye. And actually that's something that the oculoplastic specialists do as well as remove any, um, any like lid lesions, you can get, you can get cancer around the eye. And so the pathologists will help, um, figure out exactly what pathology is going on. 
So I did my medical retina fellowship. Sorry, I should have mentioned I did my residency in Arizona at the University of Arizona. Um, I then did my medical retina fellowship in New York, which was great. And then I had kept in touch with uh, Dr. Stein throughout the years. And then he offered me a job to come work with him in Toronto. And that's how I ended up in Toronto. That's where I live right now. Um, and classically, people stick to one side of the eye. So they either stick to the back of the eye, retina, or the front of the eye. But I am doing both. And it's very unique. It's a very unique combination that not a lot of people do. Um, and so I actually work at two different practices. So I work at the Bachner Eye Institute, um, which is where I do cataract surgery and refractive surgery. And then I work at the Toronto Retina Institute, um, which is where I do a lot of the medical retina. So what do I do at work? Um, I think the best way to do this is just to talk you through my, my week this week. Um, so on Monday, I was at the Bachner Eye Institute. In the morning, I was seeing just general ophthalmology patients. So that's patients that are going to have cataract surgery. So preoperative patients, patients I've already done surgery on, those are postoperative patients. Um, any general ophthalmology issues, they would also see me during that clinic. Um, Monday afternoon, I was doing LASIK. So that's refractive surgery. So that's getting people out of their glasses. So a lot of you will probably want to have surgery to get out of your glasses. And so that's what I did Monday afternoon. Um, so that's LASIK and PRK. And I'll talk through what that is. Um, and then on Tuesday, I was in my retina clinic. And typically, so I saw about 50 patients in my retina clinic. It was a that's a pretty, I'd say standard, standard retina clinic day is about 60 patients a day. Um, and it's because we're doing a lot of procedures. There's, uh, and I'll talk you through again, the kind of flow through um, the clinic. And it takes an incredible team to be able to help me do what I do. Um, so that was on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, I was doing cataract surgery. And then today I had kind of a crazy day. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, was unfortunately out on a family emergency. So I covered a clinic for him. I saw his 40 patients and then I saw my 16 post-operative patients. And that was all before 1 PM <laughs> because I had a meeting this afternoon. I'm part of an entrepreneur's organization. Um, so one of the other things about being an ophthalmologist is you're also kind of a, it, it's kind of like running a business as well. It's not just purely um, ophthalmology. So I'm part of an entrepreneur's organization. We had a meeting this afternoon. And so I did that. And then I'm talking to you guys. So the nice thing about ophthalmology, though, is we don't really take a lot of calls. So I don't take any call. I don't take call on the evenings or the weekends. Um, I see a, we see a lot of patients. Um, but it's a really great balance of medicine and surgery. So even in my day, I spent you know, two and a half days doing some sort of surgery and then spent the other two and a half days seeing patients. So it's a really nice balance. Um, this is one of my clinic rooms at the Toronto Retina Institute. Um, so again, like I said, to be able to see that many patients and run an efficient practice takes an excellent team. And we have an awesome team. So at both practices, we have an incredible team. Um, and I definitely could not do it without them. There's no way that you can see that volume of patients um, and yeah, provide good, good care without an awesome team. So the patient, it, the patients go through a slightly unique um, pathway when they come see us. So they'll come in, they'll be checked in at the front desk. They then see a technician. So just like you would initially see a nurse to get your vitals in the hospital, we have eye technicians um, that check in the patients. They check their vision. They check their eye pressure. Um, they'll take a history from them and um, then they'll dilate their eyes. So all of the patients that I see at the Retina Institute have their eyes dilated. We do use a lot of technology in ophthalmology. Um, and I'll show you some of those machines as well. So all of the patients that I see here will typically have a picture of the back of their eye taken. They'll also have what's called an OCT and I'll go through that as well. And then they are put in my room. Um, I either have two rooms or three rooms at the same, going at the same time. And then I, I go between the rooms. So they'll load the patient in the room and I'll go between the rooms and that, that keeps the flow of patients going. Um, so this here is called a slit lamp and that's how we examine our patients. Um, so again, the patient's head goes in here, the chin goes in the chin rest, forehead against the bar. 
Um, and then we line up the eye with this little line over here. Um, and then the joystick moves the entire machine back and forth. Um, this swivels in and out. And so we can dynamically look at the eye. Um, there's an option for increasing magnification here. This little device here is to check the eye pressure. Um, and then there's also different color filters with different colors of light that we use for different things. Um, and this is kind of an example of what you would see. So again, this is the cornea, that clear part of the eye, this clear part of the eye here. This is the lens and you can actually see this is the lens here. So this is the patient with the cataract. You can see that there's actually some whitening here um, of the lens and that's what you're seeing right there. Um, one of the other things that you can do with the slit lamp is you can actually examine the retina. So um, over here, you can see there's a little lens and the lens is used to focus light um, through the pupil so we can look into the retina. So here's just a pictorial. This is the optic nerve that you're seeing here. Um, and when they say that the uh, eyes are the window to the soul or the window to the body, it's because you actually can diagnose and you can diagnose a lot of different things going on with the body actually through the retina. So even just this week, I saw um, a young gentleman, he's 40 years old, had bleeding all over his retina. Um, he was sent to me, I said, you should probably go see your doctor because I think you have diabetes. And they're He's, he went and saw his doctor, he has diabetes, came back so we could treat the eye disease. Um, and yeah, so you, we, we can actually diagnose a lot of things, high blood pressure. Um, I've even, we've even diagnosed leukemia. You can diagnose all sorts of things. There's inflammatory pathology you can diagnose. There's all sorts of things you can diagnose through the eye. Um, this is what it looks like. The slit here is what it looks like when we're examining the retina. Um, and then you can move the slit around, have the patient look up, down, left, and right to be able to see other parts, the different parts of the retina. This is the imaging room we have. So we use a lot of technology um, in ophthalmology exams. So here she's taking a picture of the retina um, and we can get really nice wide, um, wide frame images of the retina that actually goes pretty far out to the periphery. Um, here's an example of a picture of the retina. So down here, you have the eyelashes. This here is the optic nerve. This here is the macula. So the macula is actually where you get about 90% of your central vision from, it's from all right here. And then the periphery of the vision, so all of your vision out here, comes from this retina over here. Um, but you don't actually, yeah, most of the detail that you see is um, from the cells that are in your macula. This is called an OCT machine. Um, and this is her collecting some images you can see here. This is the OCT. What that is, is you're looking at a cross section through the retina. So imagine you, sorry, through the macula. So imagine you took this area right here and then you looked at it in a cross section. So you look at it this way. Um, you kind of looking at it in a cross section and you can pick up a lot of disease. So that's how we manage macular degeneration. That's how we manage diabetes. Um, and actually all of my patients that come see me at the retina clinic all have an OCT. This is all the information you can get. I know it's a little complicated, but yeah, this is the camera film of the eye. The vitreous is the jelly in the middle, the retina, yeah, camera film. And there's multiple layers in this. Um, and so we look for buildup of material in here. We look for fluid in here, and that's how we diagnose and treat various conditions. This is actually a really cool picture that I found um, on the website that makes the machine. And I found it when I was preparing for this. Obviously, this is not something you would see in one patient, but these are just some examples of things we see in the retina. So over here, it says exudates. Exudates are cholesterol deposits. So you can see cholesterol deposits in the retina. Um, you can see here, this is what a retinal detachment would look like. Um, choroidal melanoma. So like I said, you can develop cancer in the eye. Um, and so you can see that. Um, and yeah, these are just some common things that we see in the retina, a nevus, a little freckle in the eye. Um, but yeah, I thought this was a really cool image that shows a, the, the wide array of things that we can find in the retina. Um, here's an example of a patient. Um, if you look over here, you can see this little thing here, we would call this a horseshoe tear. So the, the retina, like I said, is camera film in the eye. It has, it's, it kind of looks like tissue paper lining the retina. And what can happen is the jelly in the middle part of the eye, it's called vitreous. The vitreous can pull on the retina and tear the retina. 
Um, and when that happens, we need to treat this. So the reason we need to treat this is because the jelly from the middle part of the eye can seep underneath here, and then it can cause the entire retina to lift, and that's called a retinal detachment. And so the way we prevent a retinal detachment happening after a tear is we laser this. So that's another thing we use a lot of in ophthalmology is a lot of lasers. So we have a lot of imaging technology and we use a lot of lasers and there's different types of lasers. So the laser we use here, um, we use the laser to create scar tissue around this tear. What that does is it prevents the tear from getting any bigger and it also taps down the retina. So you're not gonna get the retina lifting and causing a retinal detachment. This is what our lasers look like. So there's two different types of lasers. So the patient again, sits in this chair, head goes here, forehead against the bar. Um, this Zeiss thing here is actually part of our COVID protocol that we have. So then now there's shields everywhere. Um, we use this lens over here, goes on the surface of the eye. And then we use that to focus the light onto the retina and basically put some laser spots around that little tear. This is called an indirect. Um, so this basically you can, it sits on your head and you focus light through a lens that you hold. And what's kind of cool about this is you're actually shooting lasers from this machine that's on your head. So it's, I thought it was really cool when I first started uh, ophthalmology and I thought, oh, we're shooting lasers from our head. That's so cool. <laughs> and this is what it looks like when it's done. So you can see we create scar tissue around one of the tears and you can see it's now tacked down. It's not going to lift. You're not going to get a retinal detachment. Um, and that's basically how we treat that. This here is a patient with diabetes. So diabetes is a very common thing that we see in the retina. You can see here, um, it's a really pretty image of some new blood vessels forming in the retina. You can see right here, she's developed like a fan of new blood vessels. So one of the important things when we see patients with diabetes is I always say to them that this is something that I can only meet you halfway. So I can treat your eye disease, but you still have to control your diabetes because if you don't control your diabetes, the disease isn't gonna go away. Um, and here you can see it's pretty bad. There's some bleeding in the retina here. It's kind of pulling on the retina, the new blood vessels. Um, and yeah, so if this patient didn't get treatment, she could permanently lose vision. Um, so I think if you're gonna remember one thing when you're later doctors, remember that if you have patients that are di diabetic or if you have friends or family that are diabetic, they should make sure A, to control their diabetes and B, that they should get regular eye checks because this is the sort of thing that can happen um, in diabetics. It's hard to see here, but one of the ways we treat this is we actually use a different, we use a laser to laser the periphery of the retina. So the thought process behind that is you don't use this retina as much as you use the central retina. So the thought process behind that is we'll use a laser to essentially, um, it, it, it basically affects the retina in the periphery, kills the retina in the periphery and causes all of the good blood to go to the center of the retina, which is where it's needed. Um, and then we also give you, give them injections, uh, which help to reduce some of these new blood vessels. I didn't have a picture of an after image, but she now is seeing much better. All of this is gone. Macular degeneration, also something that we see very commonly. You'll hear about something called drusen. Drusen are these yellow spots in the retina. They build up under the retina and they're nor so normally they're cleared by the retina, but in macular de degeneration, they're not cleared by the retina. They build up under the retina and create these yellow spots. These yellow spots can develop blood vessels in them and the blood vessels can bleed. So long-term complications, the drusen can either grow or they can resorb. Atrophy is when you get thinning, so the retina can actually die. Um, new vascularization is new blood vessels. So neo means new, vascularization means blood vessels. You can get new blood vessels growing in the retina and you can have bleeding then. What do we do for that? We do injections into the eye. So here's just some pictures of how we do that. This first picture here is injecting um, some numbing medication. So on top of the white part of the eye, the sclera, there's a clear coating called the conjunctiva. Here we're injecting some lidocaine, so numbing medication under there so that we're numbing that area where we're gonna do the injection. Uh, once the area is numb, we use some iodine to also clean the eye and then the injection goes through that area um, and the patients don't feel it. 
there's different regimens that we do for that. Um, this is an example of a patient who came in. Um, this is the OCT that we were talking about. You can see here, they have some, we call this some, some fluid under the retina. Here, we assume that there's a blood vessel under there, leaking fluid. And after they had one injection, this is the difference that they had. Their vision improved significantly and all of that fluid went away. So you actually do notice tangible differences with the injections. Here's just another example of someone who had a bleed in the eye, got some injections, bleeding went away. Okay, so we're gonna move to the front of the eye now. So that was all back of the eye over here. Let me look at how we're doing with time. Okay, so this is back of the eye here. Um, do you want me to keep going or do you have any questions? Uh, there's a, a couple questions, but we can go through the presentation because there's specific questions. We can. Okay, so we'll keep going. Okay, so here, that was all back of the eye stuff. Now we're going to go to the front of the eye. So that's this over here. So the lens, cataract, and then refractive, we're working on the cornea. So this is just a figure of the eye. Um, essentially, the whole point um, is to get the, for you to be able to see, the image has to be focused onto the retina. So it's like camera film again. If the image is not focused on the retina and it's focused either in front of the retina or behind the retina, you need to wear glasses. So if you're wearing glasses, it's because without your glasses on, your image is either in front of the retina or behind the retina. And so the whole purpose of your glasses and contact lenses, and then next step is refractive surgery, is to get the image onto focused onto the retina. Um, these are, again, we have lots of technology. So this here is, um, are some machines we use to image the cornea. So that's the front part of the eye here. Um, we have great technology that images the front part of it, the back part of it, um, and gives us information about how we can resurface the cornea to get the image onto the retina. These are some examples of some maps, some corneal maps. Um, so this was actually a patient that's going to be having laser. Um, and this gives us information about his prescription, um, whether he has any astigmatism, if, if it's regular, if he's a candidate for laser. Um, but these are really important maps in determining candidacy for um, laser and treatment planning. There's two different procedures. There's one called PRK and there's one called LASIK. So PRK was the original procedure um, that was created in refractive surgery. Um, your cornea has many layers to it. So it's kind of like a book. Um, and the top layer is called the epithelium. It's like your skin. So it constantly regenerates on its own. Um, and what we do in PRK is we use a brush to remove the top layer. And then we do a laser procedure, put a contact lens in the eye and let the eye heal. And then the vision gradually gets better. So the recovery time, so the contact lens is in the eye for about five, five days to a week. Um, and then the vision continues to improve over about six weeks. So because the recovery was so long, um, they said, well, we got to come up with another procedure that can make this faster. And so they came up with a procedure called LASIK. So in LASIK, what, they're, what we're doing is we're using another laser, which is focused onto a specific part of the cornea, creates these little bubbles here, which come together. And then we create a flap in the eye. The flap then gets lifted. We do the same sort of laser procedures we did in PRK. And then the flap goes back on. Um, and within about 24 hours, it heals and you can see very well. So that's basically the two procedures we use in refractive surgery. Um, and here's an image of me doing refractive surgery on a patient. So this is the second part of the procedure where we lift the flap, do the laser, and then put the flap back. Okay, so cataract surgery. Um, cataract surgery, now we're working on the lens here. So that's this part of the eye. There's different grades of cataracts. So every single person, if you live long enough, will develop cataracts. So some people say, oh, are they inherited? My grandfather had cataracts or I've never had cataracts in my family. It's a normal part of aging. And if you live long enough, you will definitely develop cataracts. Um, essentially what happens over time is this lens becomes opacified or cloudy. So you can see here, this is kind of a clear lens. And if you look at this lens, it's more cloudy. So, you know, when you're starting to get into this phase of things, you'd start to notice you won't be able to see as well. Um, you need more light to be able to see. People complain of glare from headlights, problems with being able to read menus, et cetera, and low lighting. Um, and that's when we actually need to take this lens out of the eye and put an artificial lens into the eye. So how do we do that? 
Um, I have a video for you, but I don't think we have time to play it. So I'll, I'll just send it in the links and you guys can watch it another time. But you can kind of think of the lens like an M&M. &M. Um, so it has a shell to it. And we essentially keep the shell. Um, we make an opening in the top part. Uh, we then clean out the middle and then use the same shell and put an artificial lens into the eye. So people often say, well, how do you keep the lens in the eye? It's because we're keeping the same shell um, in the eye and that's what the artificial lens goes into. That shell though is, it's basically looks like saran wrap and is about half the thickness of a piece of hair. So it's a very thin bag. It's a very delicate surgery, but um, that's basically what we're doing. Um, and the lens sits in the eye there. Cataract surgery has had significant advancements. So um, the lens we put in your eye, it's now also a refractive procedure. So what, what I mean by that is we're getting you, we, there's the option to be out of glasses. So we can fix astigmatism, which has to do with the shape of the eye. We can also insert a lens that gives you good distance, intermediate and near vision. So it's not just, oh, we'll help you see better. It's we'll help you see better. And we can also get you out of glasses. Um, so this is basically our operating room. I took this pic these pictures on Thursday. Um, this is basically patients come in. We have an anesthesiologist or a, um, monitoring the patient. Um, so this is the this is where we operate. So I sit right here. Um, it's kind of a unique way of doing things. So I look through this microscope. So this is focused on the patient's eye. Um, I look through this microscope. I control the microscope with my foot with this pedal. Um, we then use an ultrasound to remove the lens from the eye. And that is, is controlled with this pedal here. So it does require a lot of hand-eye coordination because you're looking through a microscope, which you're controlling with your feet, and you're also controlling the, in, uh, the instruments with your feet. This is again, the ultrasound machine here, um, all of the little instruments we use. This was me inserting a lens. We actually took this picture on that day, but this is me actually physically uh, inserting the lens into the eye. I'll share this video with you after. Um, there's been advancements in cataract surgery. So another laser. Now you can actually use a laser to do what's called laser cataract surgery. So the laser makes that in opening in the shell that I was talking about. It also breaks up the lens um, and can make incisions in the lens. I mean, sorry, in the... Um, yeah, it makes incisions in the lens and um, you then need to use less ultrasound power to get the lens out of the eye. So this is basically laser assisted cataract surgery. Okay, so last thing I wanted to talk about is global health opportunities. Very important part um, of my practice for me and the really nice thing about ophthalmology is there's lots of opportunities to still get involved with global health. Um, there's 253 million people that are visually impaired in the world. Uh, 36 million of those are blind and 75% of that is preventable in that it can be prevented with glasses and also with surgery. Um, this is an eye camp that we did in Kenya. Um, the really nice thing about this specific eye camp is that we did a um, skills share. So the cataracts that we're taking care of, that they're taking care of, in the developing world are basically like rock. They're rock hard, you can't really use ultrasound to get them out. It's a totally different technique of doing cataract surgery. Um, they had been given an ultrasound machine but didn't know how to use it. So while I was there, I taught them how to use the ultrasound machine, the phaco emulsification ultrasound machine. And they taught me how to do their, their, their version of cataract surgery. So small incision cataract surgery. And I think that that's a really nice way of doing um, global health programs is you're basically doing a skills transfer versus me physically going there, doing some cataract surgery and then leaving. Um, I think it's a lot more sustainable to be part of a program where you're going there and actually doing a skills transfer um, more so than just going there and doing surgery. Um, yeah, this was one of the days where we did a bunch of cataracts. Uh, this was a few years ago. But yeah, I've also done work in Honduras, Pakistan, uh, Vietnam, and Mexico. So actually going to going and working in Mexico was part of my residency program. And it's part of how I chose the program is they did a lot of outreach work in um, Mexico because Tucson, Arizona is very close to the um, Mexican border. So we would cross over and go do work there and then come back. This is a really awesome company um, or organization called Orbis. It's a flying eye hospital. Another really awesome video, which I'll share with you, but essentially what they do is they go to different countries, they have an operating room on the plane, um, and then they do a skills transfer again. 
Uh, this here is to transport people, but then it also turns into a classroom. So they'll go to different countries. They will, there's a, there's a TV screen over here. Um, and they basically have surgeons teaching local surgeons, different types of surgery. And then they actually have a full operating room um, on the plane as well, which they then can do a skills transfer. They usually work with hospitals, local hospitals. Um, and again, it's, it's not, hey, we're gonna come here, do surgery and leave. Uh, it's more of a skills transfer and something that's more sustainable. So a few parting words, figure out your why. It's really important. It's gonna become your compass to guiding you through life and what it is you want to do. Um, don't listen to people when they say you can't do something because you can do it and you kind of just have to believe in yourself. And I don't know, maybe this will, maybe, uh, maybe this will inspire you. If you ever need some support or you don't think you can do it, you can contact me. I will happily support you. Um, and there will be many road bumps along the way. Um, just keep in mind that some of these are actually blessings in disguise and don't lose faith and you will eventually find your way. And then having a good team really matters. So, um, I mean, I couldn't do what I do without the team that I have at the Bachner Eye Institute. You can also follow them on Instagram and then at the Toronto Retina Institute as well. Um, yeah, couldn't do what I do without the team that I have. So surround yourself with good people and you'll get really far in life. Well, it's been, it's been great hearing from you. It's been a very informative session, um, not for just students, but students across the board, for medical students, students, or those considering uh, ophthalmology. Um, and uh, from here, we'll go into some questions that have been asked. Um, first question from Rhea. Um, she's asking over quarantine, a lot of us have been on our computers and phones because everything's gone online. And she's wondering how that could affect our eyes on a long-term basis on what are some things we could do to prevent um, eye damage if that's being done because of looking at our computers all day long? Yeah, for sure. That's a really good question. I actually got asked that so many times that I made a post about it. Um, and yeah, I'll be on Instagram. You'll see the post. It basically, there's a few things. So the reason that you're, um, one of the things that happens very commonly with staring at a screen for a long time is that you don't blink as often. So whenever you focus on something, you're not blinking as often. Um, and so your eyes are getting very dry. And so there's a few different techniques you can do. One, you should use some artificial tears. You can buy those over the counter at the pharmacy. Um, don't get things that if it says, I know a lot of people talk about Visine, get the red out. Don't get those because you can basically get addicted to them. What they do is they constrict the blood vessels in your eyes. And so when you stop using them, your blood vessels dilate and you end up with chronic red eyes. So don't get anything that says get the red out. Just get regular artificial tears. The preservative free ones are the best ones. Um, and just keep a bottle next to your computer. Um, you're not doing any long-term damage to your eyes by being on a computer, but yeah, so artificial tears. And then we call it the rule of 20. So every 20 minutes, people set this timer. Every 20 minutes, look at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Um, and then the big thing that there's been some, a lot of research into is the amount of melatonin production you have with staring at blue light. So that's why you hear about not going on your phone late at night or, you know, winding down from screen time use just because it affects your melatonin production and affects your sleep more than anything. So that's what the blue light filters are about, um, is more your melatonin production, but yeah, just keep your eyes lubricated, make sure that for eye strain, just look away. Um, and then there's lots of ergonomic things as well with positioning that are important, but those are the main things from an eye standpoint. Okay. Um, another question from Nina. Um, you said that uh, you've, you're, you're in two practices. So she's asking, how do you manage working at two practices and how do you ensure uh, work life and a personal life balance? Um, so um, working at two practices, I basically split my time between the two practices. Um, I mean, my work day usually starts, it varies, but it's, it usually starts around 8.30 and I'm typically done by five o'clock at the latest. Um, so it's a, it's not, yeah, it's not a crazy schedule compared to most other doctors um, who are, yeah, there's a lot, most doctors are taking a lot of calls. So that means you do your 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and then you hold the pager for the evening um, or you're doing nighttime shifts. Um, a lot of other specialties, you'll do like a full 24 hour shift in the hospital. Um, they take weekend calls. So 
as far as a work-life balance goes, ophthalmology is really great. I mean, you're basically working like a eight to five job. And if you're lucky, you don't have to take call on the evenings or the weekends. So it's really easy to then balance your personal life. Okay. Um, another question from Aryan was uh, regarding, uh, you mentioned that uh, you were involved in the business side of things and ophthalmology. Um, he was wondering if you could elaborate on um, the business side of your current practice. Uh, so I'm, I guess it's a little different in um, Canada because in Canada, you're kind of like an independent person. So it, it works a little differently than in the U.S. So in the U.S., you get a job, you um, make an income and you can join, you can basically become a partner in that practice. In Canada, similar thing, but you're actually an independent, kind of like an independent contractor. So you go to work um, and you get paid and then you pay a percentage in overhead fees. So it's not like a classic employment. Um, and then, yeah, there's also the option to become a partner. So if you become a partner, um, then you share the expenses of the clinic. Um, and then that basically you have that that's instead of the overhead fees. So it's sort of like you run a practice as well, uh, because you're typically independent of most healthcare facilities. Uh, but yeah, it's slightly different in Canada and the US, but there's still in both countries, there's the option to um, become a partner of the practice and then help run the practice. So that also means you help with hiring, hiring staff, um, managing staff. So all of that is part of what you take care of if you're a partner. Okay. Um, another question from Tisha. Um, what is you, what is the biggest benefit of having a broad base of training from studying in Canada, training in the U.S., and taking the USMLE Kenya? So how can having like an international? Um, um, so I actually think one of the really great parts of going to medical school in Ireland is um, it's a to it's actually a total it's a different way of practicing medicine. So in Ireland, there's a significant emphasis on physical examination and history taking. So um, you can't get imaging, like you can't just get x-rays and CT scans and blood work like you can in the US. It's a lot harder to get it, um, partially because of the system and partially because it's just a different way of practicing medicine. And so there's a very strong emphasis on speaking to the patient and examining the patient, like actually physically examining them. Um, and so it's, it sort of gives you a unique framework from which to approach a patient. And then you come to the US and it's different. There's different ways of diagnosing things. There's a lot more access to testing um, and imaging and the system is just run totally differently. But I think that it kind of gives you a more holistic view of practicing medicine and how to approach um, patients and people that you're working with. So I think that, yeah, I think that it, it yeah, it gives you a better, uh, it just gives you a unique Perspective. way of approaching patients. And then I think, you know, traveling and being exposed to people um, allows you to relate to people. And one of the things that is important to remember when you're a doctor is you're healing people and your patients are people. They're not, they have stories and they have lives and they have, and being able to relate to them is really important. And I think that that's the importance of traveling and meeting different people and being exposed to different people um, is that that becomes a really big part of what you do in your day-to-day -day life. Okay, um, looks like we're running low on time. So really yeah. just wrapping, it, wrapping it up, one piece of uh, advice uh, for those who are considering medicine, um, specifically Charlie was asking, going to medicine is a long journey. What are some things that motivated you during times when you felt burnt out and it was difficult? Yeah, I mean, keeping in mind your why and why you're doing what you're doing is really important. I think that, like I said, having meaningful work is really important. For me, um, I think global health was a really important thing for me. I wanted to make a difference. It's really, it was really important to me and still continues to be important to me to make a difference in people's lives. And so I think that that kind of remained my North star as far as, um, continuing to achieve goals and it's long and it's hard and it's a lot of work, but it's definitely worth it. I think, um, you know, you hear about 
burnout, et cetera. But the nice thing, I mean, I think that I'm also in a very unique situation where I'm an ophthalmologist. And so we um, have a great work-life balance, but um, yeah, it's still a long and hard route and a long and hard go at things, but it's worth it. And I actually think it's a blessing that we get to look after patients. Um, was that my brother gave me a book called my grandfather's blessings. And in that she does a really good job about talking about what a blessing it is to be able to look after people and look after life. And it's a privilege to look after people in, um, vulnerable states. So yeah, I think for me, that's kind of my North star. And I actually do think it's worth it. I think it's a lot of work, but it is worth it in the end. Like, yeah, I think it's worth it. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, uh, with that be saying we're out of time. Um, yeah. But we did a pretty good job of getting all the questions in. So I want, before we go, I want to thank you for taking the time to speaking with us. I understand and that you're really busy, but I appreciate you coming, talking with me and with everybody who was here. Uh, everybody's appreciative towards uh, you explaining everything. Um, and guys, if you want to learn more about ophthalmology, um, check out uh, Dr. Galani on her Instagram. Uh, she, her okay. handle, and send me a message. You just send me a message if you have any questions or if you need any help with anything, I'm happy to help because... Yeah, I would have liked to have someone help me along the way because um, it's kind of a murky thing uh, and sometimes you don't know who to ask for help. So I'm happy to help if you guys need help with anything. So, and thanks for spending your Friday night with me. I appreciate it. And I hope you guys are all gonna, um, are all having a good lockdown 2.0 <laughs> and their families and friends are all safe and healthy. And thank you so much. I think this is actually, we were talking yesterday and I think this is an awesome initiative that you started so like hats off to you and your cousin for starting this because it's it's really awesome and I wish I had something like this when I was in high school or um going along the journey well thank you so much John, guys so that is it for us uh we hope that everybody has happy holidays uh and we look forward to seeing you back um next year with our new programs and we'll post details regarding that program um uh, pretty soon on instagram so be sure to check us out um and once again thank you so much dr galani you're welcome